Hi, I'm Dr. Ryan Colburn. I'm the veterinarian here at the John Ball Zoo. We hope you're all staying safe and healthy, but we're missing you here at the zoo, so we wanted to give you a special opportunity today to visit an area of the zoo that is kind of off the beaten path, but is really important to what we do in keeping the animals healthy. So today we're going to take you on a tour of our animal hospital. So our first stop is going to be here in the zoo's pharmacy and laboratory. So here at the animal hospital, we have myself as well as two veterinary technicians, and a lot of our work happens in this area. So as a pharmacy, we are ready to respond to any of the basic needs of the animals here at the zoo, whether that's eye drops, topical antibiotics, pain medications, for all of the routine things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, we're able to have those things on hand. We also par partner with a number of compounding pharmacies in the community that work with us to make medications that are specialized for the animals that we work with, sometimes being very, very small or trying to get doses for those that are much larger than your traditional patients. So as we explore the rest of the lab, we have a number of pieces of equipment here because we also want to be able to diagnose when an animal's not doing well and to be able to track them throughout their life to make sure they're staying healthy. One of the ways that we can do that is through routine blood work. Um, so these analyzers here um, evaluate the what we call a complete blood cell count or a CBC, looking at red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets to make sure that all of those are an appropriate number for the, a, any given species. We're able to do chemistries. Blood chemistries actually evaluate organ function, so we can look at blood sugar, liver values, kidney values, all things that allow us to determine how the animal's internal health is um, so that we can get a picture of what's going on internally. We also have an analyzer that does what's called blood gases, and that allows us to look at things like um, carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood um, to make sure that everything is functioning well there as well. We have a number of other pieces of equipment. In order to look at blood samples, we often have to spin them down. So if you've heard of a centrifuge or if you remember that from, from lab and in, in school, um, these machines spin our blood samples at a very high rate to separate the cells from the liquid portion of the blood, the serum, so that we can run different tests on those elements. Lastly, in here we have our microscope. And between myself, Heather, and Kaylee, we spend a lot of time at this microscope um, because it allows us to do a lot of different things. We're able to look at cellular samples, we're able to evaluate urine samples, and we also look at a lot of stool samples or poop samples. And that's a huge part of keeping the animals here at the zoo healthy because we do that routinely scheduled throughout the year to make sure that we're determining if there are any parasites. And if we find any internal parasites, that way we can treat them. The parasite I have on the screen at the moment is actually a really interesting one because many people may not realize that as veterinarians, we are also here for the insects and invertebrates here at the zoo. And this is called a varroa mite. Um, this is a very important parasite of honeybees. And so um, when the zoo added honeybees um, to our um, treasures building last year, that was one thing we had to be prepared to do is to perform these mite checks, identify these mites, and provide treatment for the bees when they need it. Uh, so Every animal in the zoo is somehow touched by what goes on in this space to make sure that we're keeping them safe and healthy. So moving into our treatment and exam room, if you've ever been to the veterinarian with your dog or cat, you've likely sat in an exam room. Here at the, at the zoo, we only have one exam room because we're not jumping from patient to patient through appointments, but we do need to be able to bring any size animal into this room to perform their routine wellness exams. So part of our job as the veterinary team here at the zoo is to actually have the entire zoo scheduled for routine physical exams throughout the year so that we can keep up on anything that's happening and changing in their lives as they get older. So some animals are scheduled for exams once a year, others are every other, and some are even twice a year. And that all depends on the type of animal we're talking about, as well as how old they are. Oftentimes younger animals will go longer uh, spreads between ex exams, but as they get older we want to make sure that we're keeping tabs on things, um, catching things early. For most of our exams though, we approach them a little bit differently than dog and cat veterinarians because we need to get a lot of information all at once. We're either holding on to an animal through restraint, um, causing them some minor stress during that process, or relying on anesthesia. And in either case, we wanna make sure to get as much information as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. 
So uh, during those exams, not only are we going to be doing a regular physical, feeling, listening to the heart and lungs, feeling the belly, feeling the joints, making sure there's no sign of arthritis, we're also going to make sure that we're checking their teeth, performing dental cleanings if they need it. We may um, draw blood samples or urine samples. We'll often take x-rays and ultrasound, really to get a full picture of the health of that animal to make sure that everything is looking okay. As I mentioned, some of those animals we can do under restraint. So our keepers are very skilled at handling animals. And so for most of our domestic animals, our young animals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, our keepers can hold on to them for us while we do those physicals. But for many of our larger animals and certainly most of our mammals, we're relying on anesthesia to have that animal asleep during their physical. Even for the small animals, like the smallest monkeys, cotton top tamarins, for instance, it would be re really stressful to have them hold still for a physical um, while we're doing all of those things. And so it's a lot less stress for them to be under anesthesia while we're getting everything done. We have a lot of different tools to get an animal under anesthesia, and I have a few of them here right now just to show you. For those cotton top tamarins, for instance, we'll often actually transfer them into this induction chamber. Um, this box can be attached to our anesthesia machine and we can fill it with oxygen and anesthetic gas so that once they fall asleep, we can pull them out of this box, get all of the things done that we need to do um, very quickly, and then wake them right back up again. In order to keep them asleep though, we need to use that anesthetic gas in a slightly different way. And so we often use face masks. We have all different shapes and sizes of those masks because we need to be ready for a whole variety of different size patients. You'll notice that three of these masks look very similar and that's because these are the masks that are designed for dogs and cats. These are ones that we can purchase and use on animals that they fit for. But in the zoo world, we often are dealing with patients that are outside of that. So we have to get creative. This mask is kind of homemade and was made from a syringe casing, but it's nice, long and narrow and allows us to anesthetize snakes, lizards, and even some birds using a mask like this. One of our curators even designed an extra large mask. And this is a mask that we might use for a lion or a tiger. Um, because the masks that we have are just not going to fit over their face and this allows us to get a good uh, seal so that they can breathe that gas in and stay asleep during their physical. But I did mention that not only are we serving as the doctor for these animals, but we also have to be the dentist. And so we have to be able to look at their teeth. We can't do that very well when we have a face that's in a mask, so we do have to be able to intubate our patients. That means taking a tube into their airway so that we can breathe directly for them. We have a whole variety of sizes of those as well. And here are two of our smaller ones. Um, this tube here is really a, a mid-sized tube. This would be the size we might use with one of the chimpanzees. Um, but we need to be able to go much smaller. And so this is our smallest tube. We use this with lizards, snakes, and um, some birds. And then when we have to be on the other end of the spectrum working with our lions or tigers, we can use a large tube like this one. This one is designed initially for use in horses, um, but does work for our large cats. So we have all of these different tools at our disposal to make sure that we can get an animal safely under anesthesia, comfortably asleep, so that we can get as much information as possible during that physical. So we mentioned blood work and urine samples and things like that, but I also mentioned some imaging and that's kind of an exciting part of what we do. One tool that we have that we can use here at the zoo to look inside of an animal is an ultrasound. So this is our ultrasound. We're able to use it throughout the zoo in a variety of different animals. But what you can see here is actually an ultrasound video that we took from our TENREC. So I mentioned a couple weeks ago that we were uh, happy to have a pregnancy in our Lesser Madagascar Hedgehog Tenrec, Jonah. And you can actually see a rigid line that's running across the top of the screen. It comes in and out of view, but that is actually the spine of one of her babies. Um, so this is an image that allowed us to not only confirm that Jonah was pregnant, but also to be able to confirm that that baby was growing and developing normally um, as it got closer to getting um, to its birth date. 
So another uh, key feature of this room and in, our, in this exam room is our radiology equipment. So if you've heard the term x-ray, um, x-ray is uh, what we're using to get this image, but we often call it radiography or radiology. And this is our digital radiography system. Up until 2016, the zoo had a non-digital system that relied on film, very similar to cameras, where we would take that film, expose it like a photograph, and then need to take it to a dark room to develop it. In 2016, um, through the generous support of the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs, uh, we were able to earn a matching grant that at the end of the year, you, our donors and supporters, were able to help us reach that match to purchase this equipment. This was a really exciting upgrade for the zoo that has given us a whole lot of opportunity to get wonderful, crisp, clear diagnostic images of the animals we're caring for, not only here in the hospital, but down in the zoo as well. We have a portable version of this equipment that we can take anywhere in the zoo and take x-rays wherever we need to, um, if, if it's an animal that's too large, too sick, or just impossible to move here, um, we can be on the go and do house calls throughout the zoo, which is really nice. So if you want to join me over here, I'll pull up one x-ray just to show you an example of what we um, are looking at when we take these images. We're recently celebrating a birthday here at the zoo and it was Oscar, our black-footed cat. Earlier this year, he had his routine physical. He was brought up here to the animal hospital. He was anesthetized just like we were describing earlier. Um, he had that mask and that tube uh, used for him while he was asleep. We were able to get all of the things done that we needed to his physical, we cleaned his teeth, and we also took x-rays and ultrasound. So this is an x-ray image of Oscar. There's some interesting things to kind of point out, um, but you can see this is his whole body extending from his head on this end to his tail on this end. If you look very closely, you'll see some bright white lines running through this area of his neck, and that actually is the tube that's in his throat, um, into his airway breathing for him. Um, so you can actually see that on the x-ray. You'll notice a, a bright white speck up here near his shoulders, and that's actually a microchip. So uh, dogs and cats often get microchips so that they can uh, be identified if they were ever to get lost um, and escape away from their owners. But here at the zoo, we actually use microchips to make sure that we're always identifying the right animal so that everything we do here at the hospital and throughout our day at the zoo gets put into their permanent record and we can track them effectively. A couple other things you can make out, you can see a white spot here that is Oscar's heart, surrounded by a dark triangle that are his lungs. Behind that, you'll see a large white triangle that is his liver and a darker spot that is actually his stomach. So um, throughout veterinary school, veterinarians are trained to work with x-rays to identify the normal size, shape, and structure of the organs that we find inside the body. And when you work in a zoo setting, you really have to take that to an extreme because we're working with so many different types of animals. Um, but this is one of the tools that we have to make sure that the animals here at the zoo are nice and healthy. All right, so now moving from the treatment room into our surgery suite. This is uh, the room that we would use almost exclusively for um, significant surgical procedures. It's also where a lot of our um, surgical equipment and anesthesia equipment are stored. I used to tell students when we'd have them here at the zoo that as a zoo veterinarian, we don't get to do that much surgery. Um, and compared to our colleagues that work with dogs and cats, that's still the case. We're not doing things like routine spaying and neutering uh, because most of the animals here are part of species survival plans. Um, organized um, committees throughout the country that monitor the population of each species to make sure that we're keeping a healthy population. And so most of the animals are part of those breeding programs and we don't wanna take them permanently out of, out of that breeding possibility. So for animals at the zoo when we are um, looking to prevent breeding, we use more um, reversible options like oral contraceptives or even injections that are given at a certain frequency. Um, but in this room, when we do perform surgery, it's usually because something is not going right and we need to fix that. So we've done everything from emergency surgery on our warthog um, several years ago to spaying one of our snakes that had uh, difficulty laying eggs. All of those types of procedures would happen in this room. 
These machines to my right are our anesthesia machines. These are the machines that I mentioned um, deliver both oxygen and anesthetic gas. And there's a couple different types. So this machine here is our small animal machine. Um, this is used for all of our patients up to, um, up through our chimpanzees even. Um, and we're attaching either those face masks or those endotracheal tubes to hoses like this one um, to connect them to the oxygen and anesthetic gas. When we need to work with our larger patients with those larger endotracheal tubes though, we need to shift gears up to our large animal anesthesia machine. So this machine is able to deliver large amounts of oxygen and anesthetic gas um, through much larger tubing to make sure that we're providing the right amount of air um, and the right amount of breath for each of those animals while they're under anesthesia. No matter who they are though, it's really important to us that they stay safe while they're under anesthesia. And so we're always monitoring them to make sure that they're at the right anesthetic depth. They're not too asleep and they're not starting to wake up because we need both ourselves and the animal to be safe. We have a number of tools, including this um, surgical monitor, um, that allow us to do that. Monitors like this will actually um, evaluate everything from oxygen levels within the bloodstream, blood pressure, electrical um, cardiac rhythm, so we're doing um, ECG or EKG, um, and we're also able to monitor their temperature. Um, so those coupled with a number of other factors allow us um, to make sure that everything throughout that whole anesthetic event, um, whether it be a surgery or just a routine physical, is going well, is going smoothly, and is being safe for them. The last thing in this room I wanted to share with you was our dental um, equipment and x-ray. Um, so I mentioned in, in the exam room that we do uh, routine uh, dental cleanings. Um, this machine here is our tool for that. It allows us to not only do those cleanings, but can ass assist us with extractions if we needed to do that. And then we have a whole setup here to do dental x-ray or dental radiography. And that's another really important tool because that allows us to look at the health of the teeth and determine if there's anything going on below the gum line. So this was a routine x-ray that was actually taken on Nori, one of our Canada lynx, during her last routine physical. Um, and here you can see this is actually her upper lip. You can see her nose here. These are her incisors, the small teeth in the front and the two large canines, those are the classic um, teeth that we associate with all of our carnivores, all the way up from the lynx up to our lions and tigers. And so this gives us a chance to look at those internally and make sure that everything is healthy with those teeth. All right, so this next area of the hospital is one that I'm really excited to share with you because it's relatively new. I mentioned in 2016, the zoo made the jump from film radio radiology to digital. And that left a space um, unused. This room used to be what we called our dark room. Um, it was lit with only a faint red light that allowed us to go and safely handle the film and process that. But after we made the jump to digital radiography, we didn't need that space anymore. And so um, getting creative and coming up with what we needed next um, turned into this. This is now our ICU. Um, this is a space where we can hospitalize small patients, everything from um, lizards and birds and snakes up to um, small mammals and even baby animals. And this room sets us up to be able to support all of those. Um, this room was made possible completely um, through another partnership between you, our donors, as well as um, the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs um, at the end of 2018 and it allowed us to remodel this space and to purchase a number of incubators and caging that we can safely house different animals. Both of these units here allow us to control the temperature. Um, we can set a very specific temperature, a very specific humidity, and we can hook both of these up to oxygen. Um, that was something that the zoo didn't have before, is a space to hospitalize patients that had respiratory complications and were having difficulty breathing. Um, so both of these allow us to do that. We can set them up where they have that oxygen support, but also the perfect temperature to make sure that they're able to heal um, and get through whatever treatments they need to do. So this has been a really exciting addition to the zoo. Um, and I wanna just thank all of you for making that possible. All of the equipment we've shared with you today really um, is here and allows us to do our job because of the generosity of donors and supporters of the zoo. Um, so thank you. It's been wonderful to have that 
And if you're interested in continuing to support the zoo, um, please visit our website at jbzoo.org slash donate. So now we're standing in what we call our necropsy room. And this room is probably one um, that's not necessarily as fun and interesting at first glance um, because this is a room where uh, we're able to examine animals after they have passed away. So our goal is to provide the best possible care for animals throughout their entire life. And that also means understanding what happens at the end of life as well. So every animal at the zoo that passes away has what's called a necropsy, which is the animal form of autopsy, um, where we're able to determine what is going on internally, determine a cause of death, but also allow us to explore um, both the anatomy and um, any incidental diseases that we didn't know were going on. One of the things that's so interesting about being a zoo veterinarian is working with so many different species, but that means that we're often brushing the surface on what we could know. So a huge part of what goes on in this room not only is about figuring out what happened to one specific animal, but getting the information that we can take and share um, and use throughout um, the industry and with our colleagues so that we can share what information we're finding. And, and zoos are, do an excellent job of doing that. So this is the room where we perform those examinations. Um, this room has some new equipment as well, and it was also part of the 2018 donations that allowed us to bring this room up into um, what it is today. This is a biological safety cabinet. This space allows me to safely perform necropsies um, in what we call the hood. Um, that filters the air um, that comes uh, in that space so that we're not rebreathing any infectious diseases that could be going on um, as we perform those, um, those examinations. One of the other additions that we added to this room um, during that time was our negative 80 freezer. Um, this is a huge element to allow us to take what we do here at the zoo to the next level when it comes to storing samples and being prepared for research. Many zoos across the country will store samples, whether they be blood samples or even tissue samples from animals from years and years ago, and they can do that in freezers like these. That allows researchers even 10, 20, 30 years in the future to come to us and say, do you have samples from this species or that species so that we can look back in the past to see if we can get answers about what's going on um, in the present. So um, our goal here at the zoo, like I said, is not only to provide the best possible care for the animals that are here, but also to advance the science of caring for these animals and make sure that we're always learning more so that we can continue to provide that care in the future. All right, so we're gonna end our tour today going through the zoo's quarantine area. Now obviously right now the word quarantine has a, means a lot of different things um, for all of us because we're self-quarantining related to disease. And in a zoo setting, you can quarantine animals that are sick. But in most cases, when we talk about quarantine, we're talking about new animals. Um, every AZA accredited zoo is required to have a quarantine program uh, set up so that when animals come to the zoo, we're able to screen them and make sure that they are nice and healthy before they move into the rest of the zoo um, and get uh, intermingled with the rest of the animals that are already here. So. Our job as the vet staff is to provide not only the space, but also the care for those animals that are going through quarantine. That means spending at least a minimum of 30, sometimes as long as 90 days with us here at the animal hospital. So that means we need to be prepared to handle a whole variety of different species at any given time, depending on who's moving to the zoo. This is a space you've actually visited before. So if you were, watched the video with Laura meeting our Eastern box turtles, um, these are the Eastern box turtles that are part of our head starting program and they're housed here at the hospital. Um, but they're in one of our five quarantine rooms that we have to be very flexible and create different spaces and opportunities depending on who's here. So their neighbors right now, you've also met a couple weeks ago, are our new um, giant cave cockroaches and hissing cockroaches that Dan introduced you to. They are getting ready to finish up their quarantine period with us and move into the zoo. Uh, and behind them, you'll see that we have um, additional space that we can set up in a variety of different ways. We have two rooms that look just like this one and they're designed to be flexible. We can add perching and branches to house birds and monkeys. Uh, we can also change what's going on down on the ground, whether we have a new armadillo or a new um, meerkat. So uh, the possibilities uh, are there so that we can be flexible 
and house the different types of animals that might be with us here at the animal hospital. All right, so in addition to those first two rooms, our quarantine facility actually has three additional spaces to give us the flexibility to house a whole variety of animals here at the animal hospital during that quarantine period. On our right here, we have a room, and you probably just heard a little high-pitched screaming. That was from one of the Geldies monkeys, who's currently up here while his exhibit is being repainted. So this room is designed for small primates, but also small birds. has a very fine mesh, as well as an area where we can go between doors so that what we call secondary containment. We can get in and out and do what we need to do without risking anybody sneaking out. On this side, this room is our large carnivore room. So this room is designed to house everything from large cats like lions and tigers all the way up to really strong animals like chimpanzees. So this room is designed um, to keep that, those animals safely contained in an area where they're comfortable, which also has space outdoors. So when they're here with us for about 30 days, we can allow them to be inside and outside as long as the weather's nice, allowing them to go outside. And so our last stop as we explore the quarantine hall is our hoofstock holding. This room is designed to house a number of different species. Uh, right now it actually is serving as home to our wallabies while their exhibit is having final preparations for the season. Um, but if we have new goats, new uh, bongo, any animal like that, they would be able to ho be housed in this space. It's designed with two stalls and you can actually kind of see through the lighting that it has outdoor access as well. So um, while they're here, they have the ability to spend time both inside and out while we make sure that they're perfectly healthy and not having any diseases that they would bring in to the animals that are here at the zoo. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on this tour of the Animal Hospital. Hopefully you enjoyed a chance to see a space that you maybe have not visited before and learn a little bit about what goes into making sure the animals here at the John Ball Zoo stay healthy as part of our veterinary medical program. We're definitely missing you here at the zoo right now. We hope you're staying safe, staying healthy, and we look forward to a day soon where you get to come back and visit us again. Have a great day.